Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast, sponsored by Dogs Day Out, a new do-it-yourself dog wash and full-serve bathing and grooming salon. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week, I sit down with Sarah Bucklaw, the new Decriminalizing Communities Organizer at Jewish Community Action. We talk about what led her to this opportunity, her varied background, and her secret to the perfect homemade challah on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Sarah Bucklaw, welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you here. You're the new Decriminalizing Communities Organizer for Jewish Community Action. Tell me how you came to get involved in this organization and what brought you to this uh, this opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I just graduated from the University of Puget Sound in Washington State this last May and dove into uh, a challenging job market, to say the very least. And I actually started by looking for only legal job opportunities. I'm pretty sure that I want to go to law school in a couple of years, and that was really at the forefront of my mind. So I was looking exclusively for jobs that would be at legal organizations or nonprofits or grassroots organizations doing things that I was passionate about, but that had some kind of legal component. And, you know, I applied to several jobs throughout the summer. I didn't even get rejected. I just did not hear back from anyone all summer. It was kind of brutal. Oh, Oh, that is brutal. Yeah, uh, but I, you know, I was finally doing like my twice daily Minnesota Council of Nonprofits job search um, toward the end of the summer, and this Jewish Community Action job popped up, and I was like, uh, that's not really what I'm looking for, but sure, I'll give it a read. So I did, and I, it, it sounds cheesy, but I got just extremely excited reading that posting in a way that I had not reading other job opportunities. And, you know, the more I read, the more it seemed like a really perfect fit for me at this point in my life. And the more I realized, hey, I'm actually kind of qualified for this job. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and and then the selling point was, so I scrolled to the bottom of the posting and I saw contact Dave Snyder. And I was like, Dave Snyder, that name sounds super familiar. And I was in my kitchen with my family and my family was like, yeah, of course, Dave Snyder, Shatikva, he taught your brother Sunday school, you know this. And I was like, oh my God, this is the same Dave. And my brother said at that point, Sarah, anything that Dave Snyder is a part of, you want to be a part of. So I took that advice and I applied. That's quite the endorsement. Oh, yeah. Wow, no pressure there, Dave. Right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you just graduated from Puget Sound. Your degrees are in Hispanic International Studies and African American Studies. What was it about those two fields going into college that you wanted to study them and get your degrees in those? Yeah, I actually, funny thing about me is I planned for most of my life to be a surgeon I think I just loved the idea because my grandfather is a very accomplished surgeon and I grew up thinking that was pretty much the coolest job anyone could have and just really convinced myself that that was what I wanted to do. And then, you know, I got to college and I was pre-med for the first year or so, kind of unofficially, and I had kind of a wake-up call in my organic chemistry class the first day of my sophomore year of college and realized it was no longer worth it to me to put myself through the pain and suffering, and that is not an exaggeration, of all these math and science classes um, just to do a job that, you know, I, I thought I would enjoy and I thought I'd be good at because the fact was these things were were really hard for me and I hated them. I really hated them. And I did not want to waste any more time at college, any more time or money uh, studying things that didn't excite me or, or fuel me in any way. So 
I was kind of aimless for a while because I have a lot of interests. And as one of those people who really wished I could take about a hundred classes a semester and I didn't know (laughs) what to choose or where to go. And it felt very all or nothing. Like I have to choose the perfect major or everything is going to go downhill. So I kind of floated around. I, for a while, thought I was going to major in international political economy. That's a major we have at my school. Then I thought, no, no, like it's going to be econ. Then I thought, no, no, maybe it'll be politics. And then the the way that I chose my current major is um, I had been taking Spanish classes throughout college because I already spoke some Spanish before I got to college. And I realized that the best way to use the classes I had already taken and to keep everything interesting was to do this very dynamic, very interdisciplinary major that actually I have never met anyone else who has done at my school. So that's international, Hispanic international studies. And, um, This major involves a lot of Spanish classes, but then it's also international politics and economics. So that was something that that I really enjoyed, was not having to choose just one thing. And then I found the African American Studies Department later in my time at school. And if I could go back, I would major in African American Studies only, in a heartbeat. Um, And I fell in love with that department, partly because they are doing the most crucial, most exciting, and most radical work on our campus of anyone by far. They're always the folks who are filling in gaps, who are fighting for all kinds of students who need support. Um, And then partly because I I realized in my African American Studies 101 class that this was by far are the most versatile and universally applicable major I could possibly find because I think African American studies or Black studies has to do with absolutely every part of our society as a United States citizen. And I found that it was really, really important to me to dedicate the last year and a half I had at school to, to that department. When you chose those majors, you couldn't have had a sense how important they would be right now <laughs> in the world that is 2020, no, could no, you? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. I mean, it's really, I mean, incredibly prescient. Of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we'll just <laughs> pretend I had a premonition and, you know, foresaw it all. Some, some clear clairvoyance there. But I will say like, you know, issues of immigrant justice, which is not exactly, does not exactly fall under my Hispanic international studies major, but is very applicable. And issues of race, although they are really raw and at the surface of our country right now, they have been here for a long time. And I think that that is what attracted me to both of these fields of study is that like there are sometimes in our history when we're more aware of these issues than other times. There are sometimes in history when we we feel, at least as people with white privilege, more called to act on these issues, but they are always at the foundation of our country. And I wanted to be able to understand that foundation better how do you think that background and that understanding that you've learned can be translated into the decriminalizing communities work with JCA that you're going to really start Mm -hmm. to get going on now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm honestly still trying to answer it for myself because I'm just in my first month with Jewish community action and I'm doing a lot of self-reflection on what this job means for me and what I can bring to the table. I think You know, like I said, studying African-American studies or Black studies has given me a lot of really, really powerful tools to 
dissect issues of race in our country and and more specifically right now issues of race in our state. And so one of the hugest most important parts of the decriminalizing communities campaign and coalition is acknowledging that in our country right now and in our country's history we have hypercriminalized both immigrants and poor and Black, brown, indigenous folks. And my African American studies history gives me the intersectional approach to both history and this current moment that that I think really allows me to see the intersectionality of these issues. And that is actually what attracted me most to the coalition is like, wow. They are not choosing, as many other folks are in our country right now, either criminal justice reform and abolition or immigrant justice work. They're acknowledging the the many intersections of those two movements and and attacking them both together. And it seems like the work that you did uh, organizing as a student is sort of the perfect uh, gives you the sort of perfect platform to start with JCA one as you, you know, get your feet a little more wet and get more comfortable, you know, being back doing this professionally. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I, as a student, well, when I, I'll back up when I started at university of Puget Sound, I found out because there was a growing movement on my campus to raise awareness about this. I found out that, there was a detention center and actually one of the largest private detention centers in our country, about 10 minutes from where we went to school. So I got connected with a really incredible and very new group of student activists um, who were outraged about this as well and working very closely with La Resistencia, a grassroots organization led by undocumented immigrants in Tacoma and Washington state. Um, And together we work to support those in immigrant detention in Pierce County and worked to fight, you know, a bigger picture fight against detention and deportation as a whole. So that experience as a student activist, I'm realizing more and more is very distinct from professional community organizing, much more so than I even imagined before I accepted this job. But it absolutely gives me a strong foundation for the incredible work that the coalition is doing. Um, And really, I think the most important thing that my work with Advocates for Detained Voices, the student organization, taught me is that in organizing, it is absolutely essential to always be following the leadership of and the direct material needs of those who are most impacted by the issue that you're fighting against. So that I would say is the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway from my student activism that informs the new work I'm doing with the coalition. Sarah and I talk about her varied background, but first a message from our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by Downtown Dogs Daycare and Boarding, where furry family members play and stay by the hour, day, week, or longer. And Dogs Day Out, featuring seven socially distanced dog bathtubs and the Zen Den for Shire Pups. Located near the Minneapolis Farmer's Market and offering curbside fetch and retrieve upon request. All breeds, sizes, and ages are welcome. Visit us at dtdogs.com and dogsdaympls.com. All right, so backing up, you mentioned earlier that you went to college because you wanted to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. You went to high school (laughs) at a performing arts school in St. Paul, the St. Paul Conservatory for Performing Artists. (laughs) How do you... How did you get from A to B there? Now, obviously, you didn't end up on that path, but I'm just the thought Mm -hmm. process, because that is a pretty, that's not what you would expect out of somebody who went to a performing art high school. Yeah. Uh, The funny thing is, I actually, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon long before I thought I wanted to go to performing arts high school. And when I 
when I auditioned for the theater program at St. Paul Conservatory for performing artists, I told the folks I was auditioning with and for very plainly, like, yeah, I'm not going to study theater after college, but I really like it right now, and I think it's one of the few things in this world that I'm really good at at this point in my life, and I don't have a problem with that contradiction. Uh, I actually don't really see it as a contradiction. So I think that kind of confused many people (laughs) in my life for those four years. Like, how can you be very passionate about becoming a doctor, but also dedicate four years to a conservatory-style high school, which was very intense for a high school experience. And I just never, I never had a problem with that. I thought it was pretty fun to have really diverse interests and I didn't see a need to choose one. So yeah, I I loved my time at SPCBA. I made my lifelong friends there, friends who I am still very close to today and actually live with one of them. And I always knew when I was at that school that I wasn't going to necessarily study it after high school or dedicate my career to it, but I'm deeply grateful for my arts education. And I think that that, that those creative thinking muscles have been invaluable in, you know, not just succeeding in college, but being a a professional now. I was going to say, it seems like things like stage presence, creative thought processes that you learned at at high school for performing arts would be uh, w- will still prove to be useful definitely as, as you grow into this job. Yeah, definitely. But you also, fun fact, are an author. <laughs> yes, that is a very fun fact that I like to pull out every once in a while. Well, okay, I don't mean to ruin your party trick then for when <laughs> we get back to parties, but tell tell us a little bit about Friends in Fur Coats yes. and how how that opportunity came about. Yes. So as you can tell, super scholarly work there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a children's book that I co-wrote with my incredible mother, who is, among many, many other things, also wonderful and accomplished author. Uh, And we actually wrote it for a press that my grandmother started. It's called Griffin Press. It's, um, they focus on children's books that have to do with animal rights issues. And this is a press that uh, Emily Buckwald, my grandmother, founded after she quote unquote retired from Milkweed Press, which is Uh, the largest independent press in Minnesota, which she co-founded. So she, you know, not totally switched gears in retirement, but did a bit of a 180. And my mom has published books in the past with that press as well. So yeah, we wrote this book together my senior year of high school. And the gist of it is, you know, animals really need that fur. And we, we don't necessarily need it. So it's cheeky and fun, but it also gets to, you know, an important issue in the animal rights world. So, yeah, I'm not sure starting a a very niche <laughs> uh, public publication house from from scratch is considered a uh, a retirement. I know you should tell her that project. <laughs> I I don't think I'm going to because. <laughs> I don't want to make her mad at me. Right, anything, of course. That's uh that's a pretty impressive uh retirement project though. Agreed. She's a pretty impressive person. So is there a sequel? Do you have other uh, other writings planned? Well, thank you so much for expressing interest. Um I think my fans will be disappointed to hear that there is not a sequel in the works right now. But if I get in a fan mail, maybe we'll consider it. All right. Well, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, maybe the podcast will help generate <laughs> some publicity. Thank you. It certainly it certainly couldn't hurt. <laughs> I wouldn't think. So, as uh, as you continue to get settled in, what what are you 
hoping to accomplish? What are some of the the big goals as we transition back to to Jewish community action? You know, in the upcoming you know upcoming time with JCA, obviously it's it, it's a little bit different time as we talked mm-hmm. about with you know with many people still quarantining or at least very much reducing mm-hmm. the amount of time they spend around other people. How have you given any thought to like how difficult it's going to be to do some of those pieces of your job Yeah, without being, without having the face to face? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been, this whole process has been pretty strange. I definitely never thought that I would start my first job virtually and almost never meet my teammates and coworkers in person. So that has been challenging, but I think that community organizing is actually really poised for this moment. Community organizing can be when it wants and needs to be very reactive. And I think that amazing folks all over the country have already started to figure out how we can do this relationship building and movement building without seeing people face to face. So like I just attended a workshop yesterday on organizing in the digital age. So I'm thinking a lot about these questions as are, you know, my, my coworkers and supervisors at JCA. But as far as the Decriminalizing Communities Coalition itself, which came together in 2018 and works with about 27 really, really incredible partners from immigrant-led organizations, those include Release MN8, Black Immigrant Collective, Unidos, and many more. Um, Our priorities at this point are staying the same because they're long-term priorities for mostly county-level change. So our work is focused primarily right now on pushing county attorneys, county judges, and sheriffs to limit their cooperation with ICE and ensure that immigrants and refugees can stay in our communities and avoid deportation. So like I mentioned earlier, One of the most important characteristics of the DCC campaign and coalition is that we see criminal justice reform and abolition and immigrant justice as totally intertwined. So our priorities not only include limiting ICE cooperation with with sheriffs and jails, etc., but also supporting things like post-conviction relief and warrant vacation, and things like that. So our priorities are really to limit the the over-criminalization and over-policing that we see happening in, in both these communities right now in any way that we can. Well, that's some really incredible work. I was going to ask you who as you mentioned the coalition, I was going to ask who else was a part of it, but you know what? There's 27 of them. If people are really interested, they should email you. Yes, absolutely. Think, right? Yes. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, Sarah Bakla, thank you so much for joining us. Last couple questions mm-hmm. and we will let you get on with your day. What is your favorite Jewish holiday? Oh, that's a great question. Let's see. I think it would have to be Rosh Hashanah because I'm a big, big fan of New Year's celebrations. I just find them really meaningful and very joyous. Um, I think I also have a soft spot for Rosh Hashanah because that's one of the most important times for my own family, my own extended family, that is, to gather and be in one place. And I'm really missing that this year and, and have been missing it in my last few years away from home in Washington, but definitely the, the joy and the food and the family togetherness that that holiday conjures up for me makes it particularly special. Well, that's great. And it's obviously nice that you were home this year, but of course, you know, not being able to be with the extended yeah, family yeah. had to have been a little bit, a uh, little tough. Definitely. Hopefully next year. Amen. And what is your favorite Jewish food? Oh, okay. Maybe knishes. Maybe babka. Uh, 
And maybe, you know, this is a generic answer, but Chala. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I think that might be my Nothing final wrong with any answer. Of those. <laughs> is there a particular challah, either bakery or relative made, that you prefer? You know, actually, in quarantine, it became a ritual in my immediate family for my brother and I to make a big batch of challah every single week. So we started tweaking an old recipe that we've used for years from a family friend. And we have settled on what we think is the best recipe ever. So I am going to give the secret away on the air. I hope you're taking notes. Our secret. Absolutely. Our secret is to do. So we put in a half a cup of sugar normally. And we discovered that it is incredible to do a quarter cup of brown sugar and a quarter cup of honey for that sweetness and you will not be sorry when you try that oh that's interesting yeah the recipe that i use to bake hala is a half a cup of sugar and then the very scientific five strong squeezes (laughs) of honey which they do now in the notes it is you know roughly you know five tablespoons Mm -hmm. but you try to measure out a tablespoon of honey, it sticks. It's a pain. Exactly. You got to like spray it so you get it all. So you go with five strong squeezes. Um, but swapping out a little more honey mm-hmm. and a little brown sugar for the white sugar. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, I may have to try yeah, that. Yeah, highly that's recommend. That's interesting. I'll have to let you know how that goes. Please do. Well, Sarah Bucklaw, thank you for joining uh, joining me this week. It was delightful to get to meet you and to get to know you. And Best of luck as you settle in with uh, with our friends at JCA. Yes, thank you so much. And if anyone who happens to be listening to this is wondering what they can do to get involved with some serious policy change and, and real action in immigrant justice and criminal justice reform and abolition, please do reach out to me. And that is Sarah with an H at Jewish Community Action. Dot com. Yep. No, dot org. Dot org. org. Thank you. Sarah. Dot org. At Jewish Community Action dot org. There you go. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. The Who the Folk Podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjufolk.com slash podcast. Thanks again to our sponsor this week, Downtown Dogs, the Twin Cities' largest doggy daycare and boarding facility.